Hey, good morning. I've got some gifts up here, not for me, for you, not from me, but from those who are planning Earth Week. Look at that slide up there. That'd be awesome. This is a t-shirt. I want to read to you the quote that's on the back, first of all, um, because I think it speaks a lot to kind of the point of this week. And it's by a man named Wendell Berry, who is a farmer and a theologian um, and a poet. He says this, The care of the earth is our most ancient and most worthy and after all our most pleasing responsibility to cherish what remains of it and to foster its renewal is our only hope. Um, you can see up there, there's lots of stuff going on um, this week, and I'm really excited about it. Um, not to highlight one thing, but if you wanted to hear t- me talk again, you could come at 4 o'clock on Wednesday. I'm talking with um, my farmer. He's not just my personal farmer, but he's a farmer of a bunch of us in our community. We're going to talk about sustainable eating. But there's a bunch of stuff. There's a movie tonight tonight. Um, that's sponsored by those who went on one of our immersion trips about mountaintop removal. Um, tomorrow, there's vegetarian lunch served on campus. Um, Wednesday night, there's going to be a great coffee house in the Kletz. Thursday, there'll be a, a movie showing um, of the movie Fresh. And Friday is Earth Jam in the Pine Grove. And the first Sadie people get one of these T-shirts. I would like to say I used to be a pitcher in high school, too, but I... Oh, you weren't ready. Probably because I went to the same spot. So Friday, Earth Jam, um, we'd love to have you. Hey, but this week is not only significant because it's Earth Week, but something else really significant happened. And those of you who were at the gathering last night heard. Um, And last night, I discovered something. Yeah, there we go. There she is, our very own Kate Coyman with little baby Sam. And I discovered something um, last night that I think all of Hope College is on Facebook from the hour of like 10 to 10.30. Because I put this picture up and it was like, likes, you know? Um, it It was a great moment of like, oh yeah, this is how Facebook works, like the viral thing. So if you want to get people's attention, put something up between 10 and 10.30 at night apparently. But that's Kate and that's baby Samuel. She had him yesterday. Um, and I got to go visit them. It was great. And so Kate and her husband Eric and their two-year-old Jake are happy to welcome Samuel to their family. And I remember talking to Kate a little bit. Um, you can take that down if you want. Um, you can find it on Facebook if you really want to see it later. <laughs> talking to Kate about the name, because actually the first um, text I got um, when he was born was this picture and, um, of the baby. And she's like, it's a boy yet to be named. And She and I, I was kind of on the inside loop, so I knew what they're deciding between, but we had a lot of conversations about names and how naming is important. And um, I'll let her talk someday about why they chose Samuel. I won't steal that talk from her. Um, But it does mean that the Lord has heard my cry, and that's how they have felt um, in this, that the Lord has heard them and has blessed them. How we name things and how we talk about things often determines how we care for things. And sometimes one way to help us see things is um, through, not just through language, but through specific language, through poetry. Um, I've been having conversations with friends this week about how poetry helps us to see things otherwise that we don't normally see. It says it in a different way that makes our minds think differently. And that's one of the reasons I love looking at the book of Psalms, because it's poetry. Now, for some of you, you might think poetry, I read poetry and I think, no idea what that said. You know, and some of you write poetry and beautiful poetry, I've read it. Um, But I think the Psalms um, give us a chance to see God and understand God's world in a different angle, perhaps. So this morning, I want us to look at Psalm, we're going to actually jump around a lot, but we're going to stay kind of rooted in Psalm 100. So I'd love for you to take out um, the Bibles in your pews. It's page 481 is Psalm 100. Um, Again, Psalms toward the middle of the Bible. Hear this poem, this prayer by the psalmist. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. 
Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the thing with poetry is you could pick it apart forever. And it's the same as the true um, of the Psalms and the word of God. But I want us to get two basic things from this poem, from this prayer this morning. One, I want us to see who, or really more so, whose we are. We see it right there in verse 3, that the Lord is God, that he has made us, that we are his. We belong to God because God created us. We see also in this poem, however, that we are not the only ones that God has created. In fact, the very first verse says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Who all the all the earth. Now, a lot of times I think we're quick to think, well, the poet's probably talking about all the people in the earth. That's who is to make a joyful noise. But I don't think that's true. And in fact, we can look right at Psalm 98, the prayer, a couple prayers before that. Starting at verse 5, it says, Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King of the Lord. Now listen to this. Let the seas roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy. At the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and all the peoples with equity. The floods are clapping. The hills are singing songs of joy. Now, one thing that becomes problematic for us a bit in this psalm is we see in this psalm that creation is excited for God's judgment, for God's coming back. And I think one of the reasons that creation is excited about the coming of judgment is that it's good news for creation, for it means that it will be restored fully to how God intended it to be, that it will no longer be subject to the whims of us who live on this earth. Floods will clap and the hills will sing songs of joy. Now, what's good news for us is that we belong to God, that creation belongs to God, that we've all been created. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. And it's good news for us because it goes back to our roots, to our DNA, to who we are as people. We see in another poem, in the very beginning of Genesis, that God created Adam, Adamah. Adam is where we get that word. Now, Adam's root word is the same root word for dirt. We, in, very, in a very true sense, are dirt people, made of dust. And what, one of the things, speaking of naming, one of the first things that Adam gets to do once he's created is name the animals. And I love that. I love that because um, I don't think Adam gets to do this because all of a sudden God was like tapped out on creative energy and just was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm totally up to here with my creativity. But it's a gift to Adam to participate in creation. And I want us to really think clearly about our place in creation this morning because I think so often, particularly Christians, we have got this wrong. 
You see, there is this verse in Genesis that's translated in many different ways, but that humans were put in the garden, that Adam was put in the garden to have dominion over it, to till it and to work it. Now, when we look at the Hebrew here, we get a deeper understanding of why Adam was put in the garden. You see, the word till really means to serve, to serve the earth for its own sake. And the word keep, the Hebrew word, had more of the sense to protect it, to caringly guard something valuable. We have been given the earth not to plunder it, but to care for it. It is our responsibility. One of our own professors, um, Dr. Bowman Prediger, says in one of his books that we are, in very sense, called to be earth keepers. And what that means for us as the body of Christ is that caring for creation isn't optional. It's not one of those things that's just for those, like, really earthy, crunchy people, you know, who maybe walk around barefoot, who... Um, definitely carry their own grocery bags and travel mugs everywhere, um, who are standing by the trash can and saying, nope, that doesn't go there, that's compostable. And some of you are thinking, I don't even know what composting means. So what do we do? Um, all of us are called to participate in it. And it can get overwhelming because it does not take long for us to see and to learn that the hills are not singing for joy. In fact, a group of students went and learned that there are hills that are being blown up for the purpose of us having cheap coal, cheap, ele cheap electricity. And it's destroying not just the hills, but the communities, the people that live there, their water. But we are called not just to see that we are, belong to God, but that we are called to be a people of hope. Really quickly, I remember being um, a student working at a Young Life camp for the summer. And some of you have done this, yes, work crew, summer staff. And one day I had the job of um, picking up trash, which is like an ongoing thing at a Young Life camp. It's just kind of everybody's is the eyes and the ears. I can't remember the slogan, but we were like constantly called to pick up trash. And one day I was like in one of those, like it was like this big area of like that pea gravel, you know, that's like just little rocks, tons of little rocks. And I had to go, I had spent hours in there like picking up like the smallest piece of trash. And I thought, this is really stupid. And, well, yeah, I did probably about an hour in. <laughs> you know, I was trying to really serve Jesus in the beginning and then about an hour in, I thought, you can't really see it. This doesn't matter. <laughs> I really think that Young Life is onto something in creating their, creating their spaces to be green and clean. But what I wish had happened was that somebody made the connection for me that this isn't just simply because we want to have a nice-looking place, that we want to reflect the kingdom of God, but this is how we live into our faith. This is how we care for what we have been given. This is what it means for us to be human. And we do so out of an act of gratitude, not out of an act of legalism. And it's so easy to become legalistic about things um, I know this for myself. Um, true, I judge myself sometimes when I'm throwing something in the trash that I know I could take the time out, you know, the peanut butter jar. I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. I just don't want to get the peanut butter out before I throw it in the recycle. You're supposed to, re like, clean out your plastics before you put them in the recycling. Just FYI. But you can learn about these things this week. Um, <clears throat> but we're called to live out of gratitude out of our spirit. So here is my challenge for you this week and my challenge for us, not just this week, um, but all of our days as a community here at Hope College, to live into who we've been created to be. We are gods. And God has given us creation, not to use for our own benefits, but to care for, to steward, to protect so this week, I challenge you to simply do three things. Educate yourself. Go to one event to learn something more. Um, head to, there's a table in the back with some great resources about creation care and how this connects with our walk of faith. Participate. It can be as simple as picking up trash. Again, going to an event. 
As simple as turning off the lights in your room when you leave. Start to create new habits. Little things do make a difference. And finally, pray. Continue to pray as we always pray, that God's will will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, that God's kingdom will come even now. And I'll say this, too, if you want to participate. Um, one, if you're one of those like kind of hands-on people, you can talk to Josh, Josh Banner or send him an email because our, um, our farm has some need for people to help transplant some things, and they would love people to help with that. So to close this morning, I want us to all stand, and we're going to pray a prayer together. Let this be our prayer not just for today, not just for Earth Week. It's not just a week of the year, but it's who we're called to be all of our days. Let us pray this together. Thank you, God, for water, soil, and air large gifts supporting everything that lives. Forgive our spoiling and abuse of them. Help us renew the face of the earth. Thank you, God, for minerals and ores, the basis of all building, wealth and sea. Forgive our reckless plundering and waste. Help us renew the face of the earth. Thank you, God, for priceless energy stored in each atom, gathered from the sun. Forgive our greed and carelessness of power. Help us renew the face of the earth. Thank you, God, for weaving nature's life into a seamless robe for Adam and Forgive our haste that tampers unaware. Help us renew the face of the earth. Thank you, God, for making planet Earth a home for us in ages yet unborn. Help us to share, consider, save, and store. Come and renew the face of the Earth. Amen. Go in peace.